I'm pleased to be joined today by Kevin DeBruin. He is a former NASA rocket scientist, a science educator and speaker, founder of Space Class, and author of two books, To NASA and Beyond, and most recently, To Dare Mighty Things. Kevin, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Happy to be here. I didn't mention in your introduction the name you used to go by, Fit Rocket <laughs> Scientist. Is that still a thing? It is not a thing. I, gosh, I haven't used that for anything in probably six years. That was back when I was in the fitness industry. I was a bodybuilder and I needed a way to separate myself from all the other fitness junkies out there. I'm like, I'm a rocket scientist. And that actually came from my landlord at the time. She called oh, me fit rocket scientist and it just stuck. It I was stuck. Like, okay. And you made the logo too. You had this little cartoon of you and it was a rocket oh. star. Do you have that? Yeah, I have one somewhere. Here we go. I use it as a bookmark right now. So this one's a little bit all chopped up, but I'll awesome. focus it on that. Yep, there it is. <laughs> did you design that yourself? No, my best friend did. He is a graphic designer. Currently, he's working for the Milwaukee Brewers. He used to be for the Milwaukee Bucks, so he's a professional graphic designer in the major league sports arena and i was like yo bro i need some design help so he's designed all of my logos from fit rocket scientist to my new logo that i use just for kevin jada Bruin for space class space camp box so there's the space class logo there he designed that one too so that's awesome yeah so notice the little tie on it would you wear a tie into work when you were at nasa no so that's a little interesting I hate formal clothing. I hate ties. When I started working at NASA, like I wore slacks and a collared shirt. And then I eventually moved to jeans and a collared shirt. And then jeans and a t-shirt. And then as the end up, I was wearing sweatpants and a t-shirt. Oh yeah. When I started at my lab, I would go in semi-professionally and then I found out there's a gym nearby. So now I've been going in gym clothes pretty often whenever it's a gym day that's on. Ah, it, it. I wanted to prove my worth. I wanted to get a reputation and not get judged for my clothing right away. So then once I established like my work ethic and people like knew who I was and the type of products I was delivering, then I'm like, all right, I just want to be comfortable. And there is a story where I joined the Europa Lander project and the project manager came into the room and I am sitting there. I'm in Chuck Taylor's gray sweatpants and just a red t-shirt leaning back feet up on the conference room table <laughs> as he walks in and his face just, he's a 55 year old, still has the wool, like suit coat kind of thing, prints off his schedule, doesn't use like a computer, his assistant tells him everything. And he comes in and he sees this and he's got to be like, who the fuck is this intern? And it was actually a meeting I was running. I was in charge of, so it was just. It was a funny thing. Did you see The Martian, the movie version? Yeah, I was, I think it was an intern at that time at JPL, and a bunch of us went and saw it together. Do you remember who Donald Glover plays? He's like the astrodynamics guy. He ends up plugging everything into the supercomputer for them to change course and just how disheveled he looks. That's yeah. what I'm imagining there. <laughs> Yeah, but I think you yeah. can get away with it when you're at NASA. There's something about this crazy genius idea. Like who needs hygiene when you're out there doing all this supercomputer stuff? I don't know too much about like the other facilities, but JPL, like the one from the Martian is like a college campus. It's really laid back. The only time you see someone wearing a tie is that they're there for an interview or it's someone who's asking for money. Like they're doing a pitch to headquarters or something like that. It's very relaxed. It's. Yeah. The most important thing is that we're doing the things that have never been done before. So as long as that's good, who cares what you look like? In, in your first book, Kevin, you talk about your personal journey to NASA, and it wasn't that straightforward. There was a lot of trial and error. Could we talk about that? Yeah. So have you heard of, or have you seen the movie October Sky? No, actually. No? Okay. So when this recording is done, that's your homework item is to go and watch October Sky. It's only 90 minutes long. But I saw that when I was 10 years old and I knew I wanted to be a NASA engineer like designing spaceships. I really wanted to work on the space shuttle. So for those who haven't seen it, Adam. So you never uh, had an astronaut phase. You went straight to, I want to be the engineer. Yeah. Never wanted to, I guess like when I was in preschool, 
I said I wanted to be an astronaut. So there's like a common theme, but I thought like building and designing the rockets was super cool. It wasn't, it was like, maybe like I will be an astronaut one day, but it's not like that's what I want to do. I wanted to build the machines, design the machines that took you to space or operated in space. I just thought that was really neat. I always had an engineering mind. My mom said it ever since I was little, that's what I was going to be. So maybe I didn't. And she just convinced me that I was going to be an engineer since I was a very young child. But so I saw that movie at 10 years old, knew I wanted to be a rocket scientist, but it wasn't until college that I started to take real actions on that. So I'm in college, we're supposed to get internships, right? So I started applying to NASA for internships and it took me three years and over 150 applications during that time until I actually got the first NASA internship. That wow. could apply for about 50 a year was the limit on the internship program back then. And we're talking 20, oh gosh, when was this? This would have been 20, 2009, 2010. So we're looking 13 years ago. The internship program has definitely changed since then. It's different, but back then it was 50 applications a year was your max through one specific program where all of the internship applications were housed. And so I did my 50 and didn't hear anything. Okay, next year, day 50, I'm like, I'm going to send an email to people in each apartment to follow up, show more initiative. Didn't hear anything. In the third year, I'm like, okay, I'm going to apply for the 50. Do the same thing before of like finding people that LinkedIn or Google or papers of someone in that department. And then I wrote a letter and I printed it out and I signed it and mailed it in because I thought if they have something in their hand, Maybe I can stick out, be different because emails can get lost. And I actually got one interview from that. And I was like, okay, this is it. And I didn't end up getting that job, but the interviewer called me back to tell me I didn't get the job. And he told me not to give up. This was a guy at NASA Glenn Research Center. And he said, we almost hired you over someone who did this job last year because we were really impressed with you. But we ended up going with the one who did it before. So there's a spot for you in NASA. Don't stop. Like you will find it. It's just not a specific one. There is something there for you. So that kind of really lit the fire of, oh, now I got someone from NASA. The first time I ever have contact with them telling me that I have what it takes. I just got to find what that role is. And then I got called by NASA a few months later, offering me an internship, one I didn't even apply for. I was in their system. They were looking for somebody and they're like, hey, we found your application. Are you still interested? And I'm like, yes, what do I have to do? Like, we got to sell my kidney. Yeah, I'm coming to NASA. So I got to NASA. That was at NASA's Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. And while I was there, I realized that I really didn't have the educational background necessary to become a full-time employee. I was getting a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from a small school in Wisconsin. And while I was there, I was like, I need to go on to graduate school and get more specific. I need to get a degree in aerospace engineering. Everything I was working on, like in, in undergrad was tractors or like my senior design project was a lawnmower, <laughs> things that aren't particularly useful in outer space design or not as applicable. So then I decided to go on to Georgia Tech. That's where I wanted to go. Because speaking with my advisor, he's don't just apply to the top 10 schools. He's, you can start with that, find the top 20 aerospace schools in the country, but then look at the research they're doing and find a specific professor that you like their research and that's the research you want to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I found Georgia Tech and they have two labs. They have aerospace system design lab and the space systems design lab that do systems that systems, complex project integration and mission design. And I'm like, that's what I want to do. So I didn't apply anywhere else. I put all of my eggs in the Georgia Tech basket and I got rejected. I got the, we regret to inform you email. I said, crap. Okay. Now what? So I sulked for a while, by a while, an hour or two. And then I re replied to the email and I was like, hey, uh, like, I'm sorry I wasn't able to fit the criteria. Could you show me like where I could have improvements on my application? Where were my weak points? And during that time, I was like, okay, I still want to work for NASA. So the secondary schools was UT Austin and uh, Maryland. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to start my applications for them and go in. Maybe I have to take like a gap year or a gap semester off or something like that. And then transfer into Georgia Tech. 
And I still wanted to go to Georgia Tech and I thought it'd be easier to get in there from acceptance in a different graduate school. While I'm going through this process, I'm getting emails from the Dean of Admissions or the Chair of Admissions from Georgia Tech to answer like a question. And we're going back and forth. And I just, I keep on sending emails, just asking questions, showing initiative, trying to get clarification. And then my phone number is in the signature of my email. So one day I'm sitting in a cubicle at work. I'm doing an internship in Illinois, working on jet turbine engines. And I get a call and it says, Lana, like, whatever. This is before spam calls were huge. So I like, hey, I answer it. I'm like, hello. And he's like, hey, this is Dr. Jeff Jagona from Georgia Tech. And I'm like, hi. He's like, all right, we've been emailing for a while. And I hear how passionate you are, how much initiative you're taking. And I've opened up, I've created and opened up a spot for you in the aerospace program. You have just been accepted into Georgia Tech's graduate program. I'm like, wait, what? I couldn't believe myself. I like, it was crazy. So he got that or I got that, but he said I did have to pay my own way that there was no funding available. So I celebrated for a week and then I was like, I'm going to get funding. I don't want to pay for this. It's a graduate program in aerospace engineering out of state. There's like going to be like $200,000. That's a lot of debt. So I started calling around or emailing to every single professor in the aerospace department, asking if there was a TA or a GRA available. And everybody said no, except for one, Dr. Dimitri Mavris. We just call him Doc. He's, hey, can you have a conversation on Sunday? Sure. So he called me. We had a 45 minute conversation. At the end of that, he offered me a graduate research assistantship, which paid for my entire tuition and then gave me a stipend to do research on top of that. That's amazing. Now, so right. What were you researching? <laughs> so there wasn't anything, there wasn't a specific like research in the beginning. It was just like, I was going to come in and then I had to find a project. I joined graduate school in January. So halfway through like the semester, all the projects started in September when the school year started. So all of the projects were full except for two of them. I don't remember what one of them was, but the one I got put on was a FOD detection for FedEx. So FOD is foreign object debris for like the FedEx cargo planes, some sort of project with that. And I got briefed on the project. I was just so like uninterested. I'm like, this is not what I want to do at all. And the professor, he lectures in the big lecture hall. So there's 300 of us in there. And after the lecture one day, I decided to go down, talk to him. Like people like stand in line to talk to him, a bunch of questions afterwards. So like, I'm super nervous. I'm about to ask or tell the guy. He brought me in there and I didn't bring me to school, but he's paying for all of my school that I'm not happy with the research and I want something else. So like I get up there and I'm like, I really want to work on space. That's why I came to Georgia Tech. Like I did aerospace, like I did the air, aviation, the airplanes. I'm like I want to work on some sort of space project. I know they're all full, but I fought this hard to get into where I'm at. And now I would like something else. And no hesitation, nothing's just like, okay, go talk to Steven, get on his project. So really? <laughs> but again, so like the worst thing he could have said is no, or I guess removed all of my funding kicking out of school, but you don't know if you, you're going to get something unless you ask for it. So I asked to go on a space project. So then I got involved with doing research on human architecture to Mars. So we were working with the advanced concept office for NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, and it was what type of propulsion should we use? How many launches is it going to take? How much mass are we going to do? So we created a whole simulation or a sizing simulation of all the different options within the trade space of what that could be like. So we had to figure out all the equations. So we were basically, we were researching what is, what are all of the possible architectures to get us to Mars, given a certain set of initial parameters of a short stay where you're only going to be on the surface for three months. To, to do research, there's no more than, let's say, six astronauts. So we had some like top level requirements and then it was creating millions of different possibilities and then down selecting those possibilities using a Pareto frontier with a bunch of different objective functions to like, what are our top selection architectures? And then working with NASA Marshall, presenting our findings with them and talking through down selection even more of what is the most important criteria to figure out where. We should narrow down the trade space to get us humans to Mars. 
So that was my graduate. That was part of my graduate research work. That was the first project. And then the second one was Europa. Oh. Europa is what you were working on at NASA as well. Is that how yeah. you got the job eventually? Yeah. So the second project was Europa Clipper, which is launching next October, 2024. We're going to head out to Europa, orbit Jupiter, fly by Europa about 45 times over the course of two and a half years and confirm its habitability. So what I did for that project was we created an end-to-end -end simulation of the entire Europa Clipper mission using something called model-based systems engineering as part of our effort. So it was modeling everything from the descriptive process to the mission design, like the different things, like the disheveled Donald Glover thing, putting in a bunch of different ones. So we had built a plug and play system where if you wanted to change out a, an instrument, so let's say there's two different types of microscopes that could be on Europa, we're going to try one of them. And then we just pull it out. We put a different file in. So it means we had to set up all of the hooks necessary, the interfaces that we can just put one thing out pull one thing out and put another thing in. Same thing with that mission design, the trajectory, pull one out, pull one in, hit run, and it would run an entire simulation of mission end to end from launch all the way to the end of the mission as it was designed. And we would get power profiles, get data profiles. We would see really if there was any gaps in coverage. So as we're orbiting Europa, if we have a different trajectory file, where are we not getting data from? So we would create a map of Europa a global map and we're like, okay, we don't get data at this lower part of the Southern hemisphere, but that's where we think the plumes are. So we need to have a different trajectory file because the past we wanted to come down and collect that data. We didn't have enough energy. So we had to go in safe mode. So it was building up that entire system at a first order basis. So like our propulsion subsystem beside the equation was the rocket equation, right? Like one, two, three variable equations, not like these entire things, but to show the proof of concept, because that is what Europa Clipper did and is doing currently with the high fidelity models all the way through at NASA. And nowadays, I'm imagining we have the computational power that these types of simulations can be actually on board in the rocket in real time, as opposed to like back in the 60s, you have to, I don't imagine they were very high tech. The rockets were just, you send them and you have to do all the simulations beforehand that are probably taking days to calculate. Yeah, we're not doing any onboard simulations like what I'm talking about now. No, that would be too computational heavy and it would just be a wasted space. So we'll still run mm -hmm. those simulations here and then we'll send the data on board. Yeah. So all of That's this is, it's simulating for the design process. So in the simulation that was built up, it was all done before any hardware was ever manufactured. But any, but like before there was any like real integration. So this is pure mission design. We call this concept development. So there's concept development, and then there's like the concept itself, and then there's the building of the concept and the launch. So it's like really early. We call it pre-phase A is what, what that project was about and what my main expertise was at NASA as well. What was the day-to-day -day work life like at NASA? So it depend on the project I was on. It could be all over the place. So when I first started at NASA, I was on a team called Team X, which is an advanced design concurrent engineering team where we have a room with 20 computers in it. Each computer is a station for a different expert. So there's propulsion, thermal, mechanical, command and data handling, science, instruments, mission design, everything. And we would go in and we would design a spacecraft or an entire mission from nothing from scratch, basically. Higher order than those first level equations I was using in grad school. These are actually like mm -hmm. intense models built upon progressions. And it takes anywhere from three, three hour sessions, because we don't like to do it all in one go, like three, three hour sessions, or maybe it's 15, three hour sessions, depending on how intense or how many different options we want to go with. And we'll design a spacecraft from nothing to what is a CAD model, how much is it going to cost, how much is it going to weigh, what's the power draw, what are the components we're going to use, and then like how much data is going to be stored and such like that. So we would, like, my my day-to-day -day was like in the morning, we might have two studies. So if my work day is eight hours long, I'll get in the morning and then prep for like the first hour, go into this room and we have three hours of design, which was just, I love that. That was fun where I'm like in, interacting with the customer team, which sits up front and then we all have our subject matter experts, our SMEs, the 
engineers and scientists and on the computers doing things and integrating and building a spacecraft, having the real time discussions, like we got whiteboards on the side as well. So you do that for three hours, take the break for launch, come back and it would be a separate mission. It wouldn't be like the same one. So the morning could have been, we're going to Jupiter to sniff the atmosphere. And then in the afternoon, we're doing a Mars sample return mission. So like that was very quick paced, a lot of change, a lot of different environments. So it was twofold when I'm in that environment. One of it is integrating the design, making sure the information is being passed around like the right way, answering the questions, making sure that people are having the right conversations and everyone's getting the data that they need. As a systems engineer, I was integrating the spacecraft, but then I'm also responsible for the technical, like basically the IT behind the system. So our intranet is a series of models that are all interconnected and set up into this cohesive de design environment. And I needed to operate that successfully. Sometimes we have links that break or we need to, you know, modify it on the fly. Or so normally we don't send the data from the power chair to let's say the science chair. But in this instance, we need that variable to go from the power model over into our science model. So I would have to basically open up the hood, connect things up and then reintegrate the environment at the same time. So making sure all the data is converging. That was a lot in that day to day. It was fun. It was always exhausting. Sometimes I didn't even take lunch because I had so much going on, but I'm learning so much about different projects. Now, when I moved over and did, I focused solely just on the Europa project, that was a lot of slower paced things. We're focusing on the same mission the whole time. We have regular updates. So I'm either sitting in meetings where everyone's briefing their current progress so that we can all be on the same page, or I'm sitting in my cubicle designing my part or getting my data management, building up my models and making that specific. Then we have little breakout meetings going on. So the Team X environment was a lot faster paced, a lot more activity and going on, but that's all conceptual development. And then when I moved into the actual concept, like doing the higher fidelity design, it's a lot slower, a lot more meetings, a lot more doing the same thing over and over again. But we would rerun the power analysis, something changed. We need to rerun that again and try and make it perfect because we're doing something that's never been done before. We can't adjust anything on the fly except for software. So we need to make sure our hardware is good to go. All the capabilities are there. So that one was a lot more, I won't say monotonous, but it was a lot more slow rolling, thought provoking, like taking time to sit and think and consider a lot of different options rather than, okay, let's get this design going and we'll punt it down the line when we do increasing fidelity. That's for the next phase. I've read about some of these catastrophic mission failures and it's always something like so tiny that you'd never think of without all these years and years of training. Like I, I remember one of them, I think it was just something like a single bolt, it like expanded a little bit with the temperature because they were using one fuel and not a different fuel. And it was just like, because of that expansion, it just couldn't hold the exact amount of pressure. And then it just like a whole cascade of things. So it's like thinking about it, like just tiny bolts expanding by like a millimeter that could ruin your whole mission. Yeah, it's crazy. It is, it is rocket science. It is very yeah. difficult. And that's why it takes so long for these, excuse me, it takes so long for these missions to be designed. Cause it's not like we can just pull something off the shelf. So oh, yeah, we've already brought back a sample from Mars. Let's just do that again. We've never done that. So we got to figure it out now with some of the earth orbiting spacecrafts, we can just pull stuff off the shelf, throw it up like cube sets, small satellites that are like, they can be like 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. So we're getting there. But at NASA, like one of our main focuses is to push the frontiers of technology, exploration and science. So we're going to have to go out and do the things that haven't been done before. So figuring out all of the things that could possibly go wrong is one of our most important pieces of work. So like we have something called fault analysis or like, okay, if one thing goes wrong, does that cascade around? We call that a single point failure. Or is there a way to close that off and there is a backup system to go with that or two ways of doing the same thing? That whole fault protection is something that scares me a little bit where I didn't want to get into that versus it's so complex. It's so intricate, all the different things, like you're saying, the complex systems of systems. And I'm good at that. I'm able to see all the ripple effects and put it all together, but it shows you just how 
sensitive a system could be, which is why we build in more redundancies instead of that mm -hmm. one bolt. Okay, we've learned the yeah. hard way, but that's how can we improve this for the future? And now with private space industry on the rise, how does that compare in terms of their strategies from NASA? Are those the ones being more innovative? It's like high risk, high reward, or is it more like they're using NASA's technology and like playing it safe and NASA's the one that's continuing to do most of the innovation? It depends on what part of the industry you're talking about. So for robotic solar system exploration, no one is doing that except for NASA. For the commercial space program, we have SpaceX who's bringing astronauts to the International Space Station. Then you got, you got Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin who are doing space tourists now. Axiom is bringing people up via SpaceX rockets to go and stay at the International Space Station. So in terms of like brand new technology and doing things, that is where NASA's directive is more suited towards. So rockets have been done. Reusable rockets, they have been done. An effective, optimized, reusable rocket has not been done. So NASA will pioneer the technology and then industry will optimize the technology. So that's basically what SpaceX did with the rocket launches. Okay, we know how to launch rockets. We've done stuff like that before. So if they are able to take the risk, like we like to say, the, the easiest way to make a million dollars in the space industry is to start with the billion. All right, so you start there and then you just lose it along the way. Elon Musk showed that very true with SpaceX. It's a difficult question to answer because it depends on what you're doing. Now, since the 60s, like since the Apollo program, NASA has gotten, since Apollo and the space shuttle program, and NASA has gotten a lot more risk adverse. We have a tighter budget to work at. We don't have 5% of the government budget anymore. We have 0.5% of the government budget. The taxpayers want to know what the money's going towards. We're having a $3 billion mission, we have to make sure that mission is successful because it's taxpayer money and it's not worth. The public isn't as happy to spend money because we're not battling the Russians on something. It's not a war. It's like altruistic. Mm -hmm. We are trying to advance the benefit of society as a whole. People don't really care about that, it seems. So we are much more risk adverse now, which I don't like as much. I when I got into NASA, I thought it was going to be a lot more hands-on or experimental or like figure it out. And now with technology, it's we fail everything on the computer first, right? So we figure that out right. um, and then we build it. So yeah, we're risk adverse in some areas compared to private industry, but then private industry only has the small sliver, probably the bigger sliver of earth orbiting stuff, but private industry hasn't even... I believe landed on the moon yet. I think the first private moon lander crashed a few months ago. So that hasn't happened yet, but we're still waiting for private industry to go to deep space. Now, even if it was purely selfishly motivated, I've heard about the rate of return on NASA investments is insane. Some people ask, like, why should we waste all this money going to space when we have problems on Earth? But then you learn about all the technologies that have been created directly or indirectly from NASA, like microwaves and the fact that we have internet and all of this stuff. Yeah. My first TED talk was called without space, we die. And it highlighted like all of this space derivative spin-off technologies that literally save lives, like from, ca from cancer treatments that literally save people lives to the image sensor in the iPhones where people say they would die without selfies or like <laughs> morning coffee. There's a coffee shop that uses the algorithms from the international space station to consistently brew their coffee or roast their coffee beans to then brew consistent cups of coffee. Wow. A lot of people I'd never heard of you say that they can't that. operate without coffee. <laughs> so without NASA, those people wouldn't be able to live effectively. Or was NASA a very caffeine fueled environment? Depends. Sometimes. Probably I'm gonna uh, lean towards yes. But I did a lot. Mm -hmm. The Jet Propulsion Lab, the one in Pasadena, California. So NASA has more than twenty different centers all around the country. The one in California outside Los Angeles has two Starbucks carts on lab itself that are only specific for NASA employees. But there's a lot of coffee, a lot of tea. One of my coworkers was from Argentina and he introduced me to Herba Mate. And I love mm -hmm. Herba Mate. That's my go-to caffeine source at the moment. And what's the story with the JPL peanuts? <laughs> the JPL peanuts. Okay. So back when we were trying to go to the moon, we were had we had a we had a program called the Ranger Missions, 
So back then it was just crude navigation. We didn't know how to navigate in space. Like we're like, we need to get to the moon. So we were launching rockets. We were launching Ranger missions. Rangers one through six bailed, right? Launch failures weren't uncommon in the 1960s. So sometimes it blew up on the pad. Sometimes we just missed the moon. We did that twice. Or <laughs> like we launched it. Like the moon's here. But we went over this way. So we're just trying to figure out how to navigate in space. And then Ranger 7 was perfect. It was extremely successful. It took tons of high resolution images before impacting into the surface, which was the plan. And the engineers could not find a significant design change between Ranger 6 and Ranger 7. The only thing that could come to their mind is that the chief engineer was passing around peanuts in Mission Control before, before the launch. So it became a tradition, not a superstition, that we have peanuts before every critical event. That's a launch, an orbit insertion, a landing. And it comes back from the Ranger missions in the 60s, just try to figure out how to get to the moon. This seems like one place that my field, psychology, is connecting to rocket science. This, there's just a whole social psychology to that idea of tradition or superstition. But then there's also this idea of human factors engineering. Like when you're talking about sending astronauts up into the space shuttles, like how do you not get sick of each other if you're going to be in the space station for like months and months? Yeah, that's one of the, I haven't gone through that part of the astronaut selection process. I've gotten rejected when I've applied to be an astronaut, but I know friends who have gone through and then haven't made it to the finals. But one of the big things to emphasize is crew dynamics. Like you are trapped in a tin can hundreds of miles away from places. And that's part of some of the simulations that we have going on right now, where a group of people just entered a Mars habitat and they're going to be in there for a year. So we're going to need to see group dynamics and how that goes. Definitely like movies, like, like 2001 Space Odyssey and such, like they even like the current movies now and TV shows, they have psychological checks throughout the mission. Like you have to report in to check your state and that is important. It's very important, like mental health, just they individually. And then with the dynamic of other people, that's something you can't control for. Do you Humans think you could are... manage? Say that again. Do you think you could manage in the tin can? I could, I just don't want to. Okay, so you're not signing right? up for the Mars trip. No, no, I, I am perfectly happy being here on earth. Maybe I'd go for like a vacation if they got that established. I don't want to be one of the first. I don't care about that. I'll go up. I'll just do a little joy ride and, and come back. They don't have dogs on Mars. Every time you go outside, you need to be in a space suit. I don't care that much about being like a pioneer to make that happen. I will inspire other people to go and do that. I am perfectly happy staying here and having the rain fall on me, being able to be outside yeah. and not strap myself to a huge bomb that's supposed to explode <laughs> the right direction and travel places we've never traveled before with humans not knowing the side effects of radiation or long duration space travel, truthfully. And we know some of the implications, like your eye health goes away and it's like, it is mm -hmm. something that we haven't seen return with astronauts coming back. It's a deterioration of the eyes. Oh, wow. I like my eyes. I've got great vision. I got 2015 vision. I want to keep that. You did apply to be an astronaut. Was this during the bodybuilder days? Oh, wait, was it? No, it was not. It was post bodybuilder days. It was the American Ninja Warrior days. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So I imagine that in both of those career paths, in being a rocket scientist and being a bodybuilder, you have to be very type A, like very detail oriented, very conscientious, lots of, it's really like a science. I'm imagining you were keeping track of all of your macros and doing all this crazy stuff and sticking to a very disciplined regimen. Oh man, if you could see some of the Excel sheets that I had when I was a bodybuilder, Planning out food, the weights, the, like the macros, the protein, fat, carb, the calories associated with it, the timing, like they look like rock and science spaceship design Excel sheets. Like it was really hardcore. And interestingly enough, that is the reason, my, the, one of the big reasons I got hired at NASA by my boss was because I was a bodybuilder. She was a Pilates instructor and we connected on that. And she's, I admire that. I know the type of mindset it takes to be that dedicated and consistent in fitness. And that also translates into every other part of your life. She's like, I can see that within you. So I know that if I hire you, 
based upon what I'm seeing just from your physique and the, the knowledge I know of what you've put into the fitness industry and how I've come to know you over the last couple of weeks, I know you're going to be putting in that same effort and detail on all the missions I put you on. I want you here. And that's how I got my job. That was like the cherry on top. I had the foundation of everything. And then that was what pushed it over the edge. She's like, I'm confident I am hiring the right person because of that. I don't know if you've made this comparison about yourself before, but Arnold, arguably greatest bodybuilder of all time, at a certain point, he stopped doing that and he transitioned into like, how can I make a broader impact on the world and more to like education and motivation. And it seems like that's what you're doing now in this stage of your life. Have you thought about that parallel before? Never. No, that's, that is really interesting. So how did you decide <laughs> to leave NASA and go towards full-time science education? Yeah, that's probably like my most asked question that I don't have the greatest answer to. <laughs> because as I evolve, as I just progress through, my true understanding of why and how that came to be has changed. Back right when it was like real, <laughs> when I was, I felt something was off. Like that was it. Like I got the dream job. I spent 16 years, age 10, seeing October sky to getting that job at NASA at age 26. And I'm there, I'm designing missions and like that team X environment is great, but I'm like, I'm not happy as I thought I would be. I'm like, I'm not as happy. The level of happiness and like the overall structure of my life, I'm like, something is off. Something needs to change. I don't know exactly what that is. So I started to have conversations with other people at NASA of what about other positions within NASA? I started asking about other companies and one guy, Tim, he's, if you're not happy here, you're not going to be happy anywhere. This is the best of the best. He's, I've been around. He was like 55, 60 years old, approaching retirement. And he's, I came here and it's, this is the best environment there is across the entire country in the aerospace industry. Like it's relaxed. It's fun. If you're not, if you're not happy here, you won't be happy anywhere. Okay. Like I also love doing my own thing. Like I was doing the space education, the science education in parallel. I was doing it all volunteer work and people were trying to pay me and I couldn't. So then when I was at that crossroads of I'm unhappy, going somewhere else isn't going to be the, you know, the golden ticket. What I do love is talking and teaching people about outer space. People are trying to pay me for that, but I can't because I work at NASA. But what if I could do that all day, every day? I enjoy being on the front lines, having the conversation so much more than sitting in the cubicle, designing the spaceship that will eventually launch and inspire millions. But I'm so far disconnected from that process. I don't speak to any of those people. And it's not unique to me. That's what I learned is that I'm replaceable. If I got hit by a bus at NASA, they would replace my position the next day. Yeah, there'd be a couple of tears, maybe. And then, okay, another rocket scientist. But what I'm doing now, no one can do. It's all very unique to me. If I don't do it, it doesn't get done. So that's what I started to see back then, whereas I was like, I want to use my unique set of skills to, one, make myself feel great. Like the feelings I got when I was out talking to kids and just giving questions from teachers and parents who were like, not anticipating being affected at all by a presentation or learning stuff. Like they seem to be sometimes more excited than the kids. And I'm like, okay, I need to use these skills and these talents that I've now developed. And that is a bigger impact. I just felt like I was meant for more at that point. I'm like, okay, I need to do that. But it wasn't easy at all. I was engaged at the time. So I, I talked to my fiance about it. I'm like, given up like my dream job. I talked to my parents who said, you're throwing away your education. I'm like, no, it was my education that allowed me to be able to do this. And then the lady who hired me at NASA, she was, she retired at this point. And I went and had a meeting with her and her husband and she's, you know what you need to do. She just looked at me and said that. I'm like, yeah, I know. But having you give me like true stamp of approval really, really helps me out. She's, you are meant for greater things. Like you can do it. And then I made the decision, so I gave my notice to do it. Still, like, it didn't feel right. Like, I knew what I was doing. Like, I was going to do it. Like, I, I have to leave, like, a good, a good environment to get great. All right, so I had to leave the good. It was insurance, cushy job, all great. Working for NASA, loved it. Had to give that up 
to get great. So I gave that notice and it was three weeks and I cried every single day. I would close the door to like my cubicle. You know, it's all computer over the top and look at me, but I'll cry. And it's like, okay, I, I believe in myself. I think this is the right thing to do. I don't know. I didn't burn any bridges. So I'd be able to come back But I'm like, crap. Like I'm giving up what people would kill for. Like I get asked all the time, how I got into NASA. How can I get into NASA? How can other people? And I'm like giving that up to do something because I'm not entirely happy. So I did that and I was afraid to tell one person. And that is the Lucky Peanuts story guy, the guy who oh, yeah. runs Mission Control, Jim McClure. And uh, I, just, I just thought he was going to be disappointed in me because like, he told me, like, you could definitely be the director of NASA if you wanted it. He said, I see it within you. This is great. So I went over. I'm like, all right, like, Jim, I decided to leave and, like, to go out. And he's like, good. Really? I thought you were going to be, like, disappointed in me. No, like, you are meant for great things. And I'm already seeing it. And I'm like, I'm really excited to see where you're at. And I saw him again just, that was, like, three months ago. I was back in L.A. I went, went into to JPL and to uh, Jim. You remember me? He yeah, yeah. It's like, how are things going? It's amazing. So leaving was very difficult, but it definitely ultimately was the right decision for sure. That is an amazing story. I've always been more interested in the science communication than the science itself, because I'm going into lab. I'm studying hormones and brain development. We're doing neuroimaging, which is actually closer to data science than it is neurobiology, because you get the brain scans and you just do a bunch of fancy stats on them. Yeah. and it is cool. Like I, I've gotten good at programming and I like it, but I like much more doing these podcasts and talking to people, whether it's about neuroscience or I think this is the first one we're talking about rocket science. So this is really cool. And it's making that broader impact. But I have an advisor, Steven Pinker. Have you heard of him or read any of his books? I've not. No. So he's well, yeah, send me over some good stuff. I'm always, we'll do. always learning. So he's I think the closest cognitive psychology has to a Neil deGrasse Tyson because he's written a bunch of popular books and okay. has transitioned more from research to science communication in the later half of his life. And I've talked to him about, I like what you're doing more than I like the actual science itself. And he said, but I've got here after doing decades of the hard technical research, like you need to hone yourself. And it seems mm -hmm. like similarly in what you're doing, you couldn't have gotten here without honing yourself and learning all the nitty gritty details. You could go straight into like science journalism, but I guess you just wouldn't have the technical background to be as effective a communicator as you currently are. Yeah. Oh, I could get on a soapbox and talk about this for, for a while, this part, because we have the age of social media. There are so many, how would I put this, accounts or pages or platforms out there on Instagram, on Twitter, on TikTok that they're like space promotional pages or someone who just likes space, who starts to, to post content and things, or there's pages that don't have faces with them and they just reshare photos or things like that. And how do you know any of that is credible? There is so much misinformation. Half of my job is battling misinformation. I feel at times and it's, it's needing that, that experience, the credibility behind you. So the letters next to your name, the actual work in the industry, like once you're, once you're post-graduation and get in and you're doing like these projects. So like the simulations I did at Georgia Tech, great. Once I actually started working and the politics that go into it, not just like internal NASA politics, but literally governmental politics and how missions actually have to go. There is just, it's so multifaceted. So yeah, you're talking about science, but it's okay. Why aren't we going to, to Venus? Why haven't we been back to Venus? We're talking about this or like, why is the James Webb Space Telescope? still being built and it's calling $10 billion when it was initially said to be like a billion dollars. Like, why are things like that going? So you can talk about the science, but to know the whole thing, you need to also have that real industry experience to go along with it. And there's trying to figure out like which direction it's going to take you. There is so much with it. You're able to deliver I would say a higher quality product in terms of science communication when you have the fundamental understanding. So something we like to say at NASA, mm -hmm. at JPL specifically, is that the best systems engineers are the ones we train ourselves. 
So the best systems engineer isn't someone who has a degree in systems engineering. You can get a degree in systems engineering, but what GPL likes to do is they like to hire individual engineers. So that's an electrical engineer, mechanical, computer science, engineering physics, aerospace, and then train them to be a systems engineer. So we call it the systems engineering T, where like you need to know a little bit of everything, but you have one deep discipline. So you understand what is fundamental. So like down to the nuts and bolts of mechanical engineering, why do we choose aluminum versus titanium? Because you had that deep understanding in one discipline, you're actually able to fathom and go down the rabbit holes in each other discipline better because you have that foundation. So we say the best systems engineers are the ones that then start to build basically like a two by four frame for a house. So then you do a deep dive in electrical, you do a deep dive in the aerospace, deep dive in thermals, and you build that all up because you have that root understanding. Now, if you're just someone who likes space, you're doing space journalism, that's great. You can translate or regurgitate press release, but you can't truly understand or answer the questions yourself. And we need both. We do. We need the people that are able to translate a press release into something that's more digestible. We need people who can just regurgitate the information that's out there to get it to different communities. But to, I would say, make the in. The impact that we've seen with Carl Sagan, with Neil deGrasse Tyson, with Bill Nye, with Steven Pinker, did I get it right? Yeah. yeah. Steven Pinker is that they have that basis, right? They're seen as credible sources. They're not just seen as entertainers. Some of them now, yes, there's a lot of controversy about Bill Nye is just an entertainer. He's not a scientist or other things like that. Even Carl Sagan was looked down upon by his peers because he was the first true space popularist. People started to question his credibility because it's like, why aren't you in the lab? Why aren't you doing this? Why are you on late night TV talking about this stuff? I just learned a couple of days ago, Carl Sagan wrote a book called Dragons of Eden, and it was like speculations about the evolution of human intelligence. So he was dabbling in my field. I had no idea. Uh, I, I think yeah, he I was, have not learned that either. I think he was doing the same thing, like knowing that he's approaching a scientific field that he doesn't have expertise in, but knowing he has this scientific mindset in general. And like trying to use that to translate what he got as a non-expert, but a scientific non-expert into layman terms. And yeah, I have, I, so I haven't read it yet, but it's, yeah, we need every single level of that translation all the way from like the academic research paper or the NASA report all the way down to the TikTok video. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I really like to do that I haven't seen anyone else do at the moment is I will take the scientific paper. I will go through it and then I will make it digestible for other people. And I do that only in like my realm of expertise in the outer or like in solar system exploration, because nine times out of 10, I know the authors of the paper and I reach out to them and I'm like, this is my simplified version. What do you think? And they give me like a stamp of approval of, yeah, you did not sacrifice too much precision for understanding here. You got it. And that can really only be done if you have that background of experience to go with that. Have you played around with chat GPT at all? If you gave it a dense scientific text and then asked it to summarize, does the summary meet your criteria knowing that you actually know what it should say? Oh, I have not done that. I have not played with chat GPT at all. Truthfully. Oh, it's worth doing. It's interesting. It can, yeah. it just makes up a lot of facts. So it, in a way it's contributing to the misinformation problem. They call <laughs> it chat GPT hallucinations. But at the same time, sometimes it does a really good job. So as mm -hmm. long as you know what a good output actually is supposed to look like, so you can't just get fooled by something that sounds credible but isn't, it can be really cool. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I got asked a few weeks ago on a podcast what I thought like the future of AI was in, in space missions. Would it be able to accelerate our mission timelines? And I said no, because... It would probably take longer to go through and make pull out all those hallucinogens you're talking about rather than just being from the ground up with us. Yes, it has a place, definitely, in, in mission design, but... AI, as in the context of space navigation and flight software, is how I sell this transition I made from astronautics to cognitive science. Because when, when people hear that I, I started off physics, then was taking astronautics classes and thinking about that, and then to math, to cog sci, AI was the bridge between all that, and then that just in inspired me to go into studying human cognition when realizing that we don't even understand that enough 
<laughs> to replicate it in machines. True. Yeah. Like one of my first projects at Georgia Tech was building neural networks. Yeah. That was like my first experience with it and having, oh gosh, it's escaping me right now. It's not discrete. What's, a, what's the opposite of discrete? Continuous? No. Continu it's a different output every time. I'm thinking of the name. Stochastic? Oh yes. Stochastic. Yeah, that's it. We're like basically stochastic simulation. That's what humans are, where there, there's yeah. no way we're going to be discrete. That's impossible. It's like you put it in the human will. So learning about that, that blew my mind. So it's, AI scares the crap out of me. I will definitely tell you that. But I like, when we're talking about AI, like if we're like, take over the world, Terminator, iRobot, things like that, whatever, like actual like sentient style beings. The thing that I always throw out there is, okay, we can train AI to be good. What's good? What's bad? What's good for me is different than what's good for you. Then mm -hmm. what's good for someone else. So it's arbitrary of what's good. So who decides or what committee or whatever it would be to decide what is good, what is acceptable. And that's where I think like the power is there, but it's all, everyone has a different opinion of what things should be. Have you heard of the paperclip alignment problem? No, do tell. This is a thought experiment by a philosopher who works in like morality or ethics of AI. And the basic idea is that if you don't build in something like moral values into artificial intelligence, then you could have something as simple as an AI whose job is just produce as many paper clips as possible, as efficiently as possible. And then if, if completely unconstrained, it could evolve in such a way that it just starts turning the entire earth into a paperclip factory and turning all of our natural resources. Just like, how can <laughs> I produce more paperclips? Unless you build in some, uh, what are those laws from like the 1950s? Maybe the, it was this science fiction author, but it's like the three laws of AI and it's like, you shall not harm any humans. Something, yeah. something like they that. They say that in the movie iRobot with Will Smith. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. I think it was iRobot that I was thinking of because that was originally a, an Isaac Asimov book, right? Oh, I don't know. I think so. Could be. So with what you said about having this technical depth and being able to translate that in a digestible way, and then scientific journalists without the same technical background being able to translate that in an even more general way, what you might think that you're dealing in this sort of middle area and not communicating directly like on YouTube and what you're doing with kids, but to these other scientific journalists, what is it about working with kids specifically that inspires you? They're not tainted by society yet. Their, their imagination runs wild. They still have imagination. They're curious. That's what it is. He's like, they're fun. <laughs> uh -huh. Where it's not that they like accept everything, but they're just like, they ask the questions that should be asked that they don't have any sort of blinders or anything put on. And that's also our future, right? So what is the next generation going to look like? Yes, now more kids say they want to be YouTubers than astronauts. And that was like a huge cut to the heart for a lot of us in the industry. <laughs> but it's, it just, it makes me feel more like a kid. Where I, uh -huh. like I am a big kid, so I can relate with the kids. It lets my inner child come out a little bit more and I can just be goofy. And I enjoy that. It's just, it brings a larger smile to my face with that. Because I can also make, I can make it more fun. Where like some of the jokes or references that I would make in a formal setting or something like this, they, like they might not hit that well. Or I'm not going to see you actively giggle. <laughs> Yeah. When we talk about Uranus, okay, maybe you will, but as small as that is, just seeing the kid, like when I say, what's this planet? And they all start giggling. It just <laughs> it makes me inside. I like that. Yeah. And there's no imposter syndrome in kids. Of, is this going to be a dumb question where in a university setting, everyone's thinking it, but you might be afraid to ask. Yes. Yeah, that true. And I will say with kids, you talk about imposter syndrome, I'll flip it. I don't feel imposter syndrome when I'm talking to kids. No, it's, yeah, I know more than you. I am the right person to say this. I've done this. You put me in some sort of other setting sometimes, like an international symposium. I'm like, there are people out here that are much more informed about space than me. I know my stuff better than them, but they're also 50, 60 years old. 
I'm not that old yet. They have another 20 some years of experience on me. So I can have him. I not, I can have, I do have imposter syndrome when I'm talking to more academic or elite style professionals, because I know how much I don't know. So there's the four types of knowledge. I used to say three and I've recently learned there's four. There's the known knowns, the things that there's the known unknowns, the things, you know, you don't know, like, I don't know stuff about what you're majoring in, what your PhD is in. So I learned from you. Then there's the unknown unknowns, the things I don't know, I don't know. And that only comes up when, like you said about the paperclip thing. I didn't know. I didn't know that until you brought Uh it up. Right. And then there's the unknown knowns. That one I'm still trying to grasp on, but the more, you know, the more known unknowns that you have, the more things I learn that are out there that I don't know, the more imposter syndrome I have, because I know that there's all these caveats. There's all these small things like just going up in school where they teach you like, okay, gravity is a force. You get into grad school. Hey, gravity is not a force. It's just something we tell you to get through college. Now it's the warping of space time. And you're like, what else is there out there that I don't know about? Uh So they're it's the shores of ignorance. As my island of knowledge grows, the shores of ignorance continually get larger and larger as well. So that's where I feel like when I'm in those more advanced environments where I am talking more detailed down into the weeds and not just Mercury, the fastest planet, I know that's true. If I start going into the deep weeds more and more, there are much, many more opportunities where there's something out there that I just, I might not know. There's a name for this in psychology. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's the idea of your confidence in your own knowledge. If you don't know much about it, about a subject, but you don't know that you don't know, you're actually fairly confident. So it's this. (laughs) And then as you learn more, it goes down. And then this is like grad school. This is like your rock bottom of just everything being thrown at you. And you feel like you don't know anything, even way more than an undergrad. And then eventually you get your confidence comes back with true mastery. Although people usually draw it like a backwards J. So the, even the master, like their confidence would be lower than the person who knows nothing about it. Cause again, it's like that Socrates idea. True knowledge is knowing that you don't know. Yeah. (laughs) So the Dunning Kurum Kruger Dunning Kruger effect. Yes. And I was thinking about another thing in that fourth category, an unknown known, it could be something like intuition or a gut feeling. Like when you're talking about You don't know what it is about NASA. Like, why weren't you happy here? What is the next step? You don't know what it is exactly, but you know that there's something to move towards. And then looking back, you can explain it. Yeah, I think that's really where it rolls into because it was Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, that quoted someone from NASA saying there's three types of knowledge. And I put that in my TED Talk. I put that in my book. I love that. And it was, yeah, it was just a couple of weeks ago that I found that the actual quote came from or the, he paraphrased someone who said the four types of knowledge, those unknown mm-hmm. knowns. And it's something like exactly what you were just saying is it's known, but not acknowledged or not known yet, but there's a hint of something. Another cool connection between my field of cognitive science and like astrophysics is this concept of entropy. Entropy people learn about in, in physics and disorders growing in the universe, but people also use it in neuroscience to talk about uncertainty in the brain. So if you're a computational neuroscientist, you're viewing the brain as this predictive processing machine, and there's going to be a certain level of prediction error that's involved. And you can quantify that in terms of entropy. So there's a bunch of fancy computational theories, but it boils down to greater prediction error means greater anxiety. And one theory of where emotion comes from is that anxiety is felt uncertainty and positive affect is like things are going the way you want them to do it. In a sense, your predictions are working and you feel positively because of that. And you can connect that to evolutionary theory, the organisms that felt good when their predictions were going good, kept doing it more. And the organisms that felt bad, as long as it doesn't get too crazy, that's sort of motivation to fix your predictions. So I thought that was a very cool connection between physics and neuropsychology. Yeah, that's amazing. I love learning about that and seeing there is, everything is interconnected, right? There's nothing that's like truly siloed. And even like showing 
what is it? If you look at an eye and you look at a galaxy, like they look similar, you look at uh -huh. nebulas and then you look at down at the atomic level, the quantum level, like the connection seems similar. And it's like everything, everything is connected in some way. You see these natural laws or like constants, like things like the golden ratio, both at the mm -hmm. universe level and like in biology. Like I think snail shells or something like that, they approximate yeah. the golden ratio. And I think yep. you get it with galaxies too. It's very interesting. Very mysterious. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, things like that excite. That's why to quote Frank Shamrock, I'm always a student. He's continuing to learn. There's so much out there. So much. Kevin, we should close plugging your most recent book, To Dare Mighty Things. Now, your first one to NASA and beyond was more of an yeah. autobiography. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. You got them both. <laughs> All right. What is To Dare Mighty Things about? So To Dare Mighty Things is a guide to an out of this world life. Basically, I hit the lowest point of my life on September of 2021, where I contemplated ending my own life and I didn't. And I didn't understand why. This is kind of like the unknown known at the moment where I'm like, I don't know why I did, like why I'm still here. I want to figure this out. And basically what I did is I turned it into a survival guide for other people. Like I, I needed to put a meaning to my suffering, kind of like in Victor Frankl's man search for meaning. He quotes Nietzsche mm -hmm. says, well, a man with a how can, a man with a why can bear almost any how. Well, I wanted to use my suffering as a way to help other people avoid suffering or get through their suffering. And it wasn't just suffering. It was like, I'd done a good amount of things. Like I became an NASA rocket scientist. I was a bodybuilder. I competed on American Ninja Warrior, still work with the show. I then left NASA, started my own companies. I've been on TV. I teach space camps. I'm an entrepreneur, like all of these things. I'm like, okay, like I want to share my knowledge with the world in a motivational, exciting way, like to NASA and beyond. Yeah, this is my journey into NASA. I get asked that a lot. So I put it into a book form. People ask me, like, here you go, read this. If you got questions, reach out. But to dare mighty things is really a way to achieve anything in life, no matter what your current state. So even though I almost ended my own life back in 2021, I was still thriving. I launched a company in 30 days from no idea. Just like we're talking about designing spacecrafts. I'm like, I have this idea, launched the company 30 days later. I ran a 530 mile after getting in a motorcycle accident where I couldn't exercise for seven weeks because of my leg. Like I was doing things that I couldn't fathom why I was still being successful, even though my mental health was completely in shambles. When I looked back on it, I realized that the same process that I was designing spacecrafts for is the same process it took me to achieve my dreams. So it was a five-step process mm -hmm. of, I went through this in TMAX at JPL where level one, is cocktail napkin. You have that idea, like the idea, I want to be a rocket scientist. I want to launch a company. I want to run a 530 mile. Level two, initial feasibility. Is it possible? Yes, I can become a NASA rocket scientist. Yeah, I can launch a company. Like other people have done it. I can do it. Like I can run a 530 mile. They broke the four minute mile. So me at 530, it's not against the laws of physics. And that's where most people stop is they don't believe in themselves or they let the doubters come in or it's, oh, this is a great idea, but you'll never be able to do that. So then level three is trade space, figuring out different ways to do the design. Do we want to use solar propulsion, solar electric, chemical propulsion, or do we want to use nuclear propulsion? Okay, if I'm going to be a NASA rocket scientist, do I be an aerospace engineer, a mechanical engineer, go to Georgia Tech, or if I get rejected from Georgia Tech, do I go to UT Austin or Maryland and then go over to Georgia Tech? So figure out all the different ways to do something like that. And then level four is point design where you pick one. So I picked my Georgia Tech. We pick solar electric propulsion. We pick whatever it is going to be to launch the company where I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to create space class. I'm going to create online lessons for kids. This is the path. And then step five is concept baseline where you actually take the action. So I applied to Georgia Tech. I applied to NASA. We actually, at NASA, we have a concept baseline. We have our CAD model. We got our mass power we got our data and we go here's our spacecraft this is what we this is what we want to do and then you just refine that process over and over again and that's what we do at nasa is like 
I was saying when I got on Europa Lander, the Europa project, it's the same thing over and over, optimizing, making sure it's perfect. That's what happens in life. Like I got rejected by Georgia Tech. So then I need to go back to the trade space, figure out what am I doing? What are the other options? Okay, pick one, take the action. Same thing with when I was launching the company. I got a cease and desist a week after I launched the company. All right, I got rejected. There was some failure there. Let's go back to two. I still believe I can do it. Three, what are the other options that are out there? Four, pick one. Five, take the action and go for it. So I realized all of this. And this is why I didn't collapse in on myself like a black hole back in 2021, even though everything was pointing in that direction. That coupled with all of the personal development that I was doing in the years prior, I was preparing myself for success. I was like, okay, these are what the most successful people do. We work out, we journal, we, we create support networks. We have good work ethic. Like we sacrifice current present fulfillment for later joy. It's like the bigger thing is coming later. Instant gratification is not a thing. The word I was trying to think mm -hmm. of. And I'm like, all of those actually is what allowed me to survive the chaos. I learned like to get through it. I was preparing for success, but because I was preparing for success, it actually allowed me to get through the worst time in my life. So I'm mm -hmm. like, I need to share this information with other people. Like this, this is why, I mean, this is why I've been able to do everything that I've been able to do. I want to share this with other people. And then I started to look at everybody else and by everybody else, anyone who's been like successful is the process is the same. So I highlight them throughout the book. I highlight Sylvester Stallone. I highlight Steven Spielberg. We throw Oprah in there, Mother Teresa. And we just see these stories that like, it's all the same process. They're just applied in different avenues. And I'm like, it took me until I was post 30 to become aware of this, right? I'm mean, as a rocket scientist. Like I, I know all this. If it took me this long to figure it out, it's going to take other, it could take other people longer. But here, learn this awesome new uh -huh. thing that I just figured out that's not new, but like we all need to know because it's what allowed me and so many other people to get through life and achieve the dreams that we've had for ourselves. I can really that's see the, the connection there between that engineering bodybuilder mindset and what a lot of self-help psychologists are saying. There's one I like named Jordan Peterson, and he talks about how people tend to disregard like the little things like what does it matter if I eat or work out today I can do that tomorrow I want to focus on the big thing and he's the things that you do every single day actually constitute most of your life those are the big things you have to get those little micro routines right yeah yes exactly 100 percent like also what I've seen out there is there's a lot of raw personal development kind of stuff and I'm like this is like a science process yeah it's a step process and i'm like it's not just like i'm gonna manifest this and make that happen i'm like no i got like a whole list of things that you could like actively go and do to make this happen not just sitting in a chair and imagining myself sitting in a ferrari make it happen i'm still in training but you can say you have this psychologist's approval of that awesome process. hey great great <laughs> thank you so much for your time kevin yeah, thank you, Adam. This has been a great conversation. I, I loved what I learned today from you. This is this has been fantastic. The Me paper clip and the uh, Dunham, no, during Kruger, Dunning Kruger, Dunning Kruger. All right, I'm gonna have to write that down so I don't forget. Dunning Kruger. All right, thanks, Kevin.